Beijing thought it could force Australia to give in on key issues by weaponizing trade, but it turned out to be a running joke. In May 2020, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, announced anti-dumping and countervailing duties totaling 80.5% on Australian barley imports. Since then, as many as 20 products from lobster and beef to wine and coal and even liquefied natural gas have been affected, directly threatening Australia's exports worth 20 billion Australian dollars or about 14.5 billion US. Given Australia's dependence on the Chinese market, which accounted for nearly 40% of its exports at the time, such sudden economic decoupling came as a heavy blow. The CCP didn't hide the reasons for the punitive action against Australia. In November 2020, the Chinese embassy in Canberra handed out 14 articles of discontent to Australian media outlets such as Nine News, SMH and The Age. It seems to pressure the Morrison government to change its position on key policies. The list of 14 areas where Beijing believes Australia is responsible for the deteriorating relations between the two countries includes the following. Australia's call for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19, the decision to ban Huawei from 5G tenders in 2018, the blocking of 10 cases of Chinese investment in Australia's infrastructure and agriculture, the cancellation of visas for Chinese academics to Australia, and a raid on Chinese journalists in Australia, and so on. The Australian government ignored the threats from the CCP and quickly adopted a strategy of diversification of trade. The country looked for new trading partners and sought to export products to other countries in order to reduce its dependence on China. This approach has been remarkably successful. The Australian Treasury estimates that Australia lost about 3.9 billion US dollars in exports to China in the first year of the trade sanctions. But at the same time, the exports to the rest of the world increased by about 3.2 billion. The net loss of 720 million represents only 0.25% of Australia's exports. And due to the surge in iron ore prices, Australia's iron ore exports to China have increased by 10% since the sanctions took effect. According to the mining website Australian Mining, Chinese imports of iron ore from Australia reached approximately 10.8 billion US dollars in June 2021 alone, an increase of approximately 720 million over the same period a year ago. Moreover, the economic situation is getting better for Australia. Data published by the Chinese General Administration of Customs in January 2022 shows that China's imports from Australia in 2021 increased by 40% year-on-year. What's more, the value of China's trade deficit with Australia reached 98.4 billion US dollars. That is, China's imports from Australia far exceeded its exports to Australia, a difference of almost 100 billion. Australia has become the second largest trade deficit country for China. This is partly because the prices of commodities such as iron ore and coal are trading at high levels. The trade figures show that China is having trouble getting rid of its dependence on Australia for its mineral resources. While Beijing has banned imports of Australian coal, China still has a strong demand for other minerals from Australia. China's imports of minerals from Australia amounted to 137.3 billion US dollars in 2021. In the first half of 2021, Australia's agricultural exports to China fell by 31% compared to the same period in 2020, but Australia's agricultural exports to the rest of the world increased by 29%. By November 2021, Australian coking and power coal exports had more than doubled due to soaring coal prices and strong demand from other countries. Whitehaven Coal, an Australian coal company, said last year that China had banned imports of Australian coal and sought to buy it from other countries, effectively spending more money on the same product indirectly. The outside world has witnessed that instead of silencing Australia, the coercive measures of the CCP have had the opposite effect and strengthened Australia's resolve to resist the CCP. At the G7 summit in the UK in June 2021, the Australian delegation distributed copies of the 14-point list of grievances from China to the heads of state, which may well have helped Western countries see Beijing's intimidation of Australia. In the meantime, Australia has strengthened its quadrilateral security dialogue with India, Japan and the US. 
In September 2021, Australia established the AUKUS Trilateral Security Partnership with the UK and the US, in which the UK and the US have agreed to help Australia develop and deploy nuclear-powered submarines, the most challenging operation against the CCP regime. This event also marked Australia's move to a more central position in the Five Eyes Alliance. Australia has demonstrated to the world that there is money to be made in resisting the CCP. On February 10, 2022, when the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was in Australia, he said in an interview that China's attempts to squeeze Australia economically had backfired and that the CCP had more to lose than Australia. He also said that by confronting the CCP, Australia had set a very strong example for the world which would make the CCP think twice in the future. Nothing is inevitable. Um, I think that's, uh, well, maybe the only thing that's inevitable in, in life is, is death and taxes, as has often been said. But beyond that, um, no, and, and uh, having, having said that, uh, I think we, we share concerns. Uh, that uh, in recent years China has been acting more repressively at home and more aggressively uh, in the region uh, and, uh, and indeed uh, potentially uh, beyond. But as I said, what brings us together, what uh, unites us is a, an affirmative vision for what uh, the future can bring, uh, but, but, but also a commitment to defend uh, the, uh, the rules-based system that we have spent uh, tremendous uh, time and effort building uh, over these many years. Among Australia's allies, India should be one of the most benefited partners. In February 2021, former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott was appointed by current Prime Minister Morrison to meet with Indian Prime Minister Modi as a special trade envoy. He published an article in the media saying that India was the perfect replacement for China in the global supply chain and that the acceleration of bilateral trade between Australia and India signaled the drift of the democratic world away from China. It is understandable why Australia sees India as the next active partner in its economic development. Australia needs to find a new economic engine as its economic relationship with China is not likely to return to the past. While Australia's primary industries are agriculture, forestry and mining, they are complemented by India's manufacturing sector. India is a democratic country with a population of about 1.36 billion. As of February 11, 2022, Indian and Australian negotiators are close to clinching a limited trade pact or so-called early harvest agreement. Trade negotiations received a push after the US, Australia, Japan and India pledged to set up a so-called Quad Group in response to China's economic and military expansion. Australia and India launched negotiations for a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement back in 2011, and in 2020 Indian Prime Minister Modi and his Australian counterpart decided to speed up the negotiations for a trade deal while agreeing to resolve some bilateral issues. Two-way trade in goods and services has grown in value from 13.6 billion US dollars in 2007 to 24.3 billion in 2020, according to government estimates. Addressing fears among India's domestic industry and farmers about a bilateral trade pact with Australia, the Indian Trade Minister said, I feel empowered to be able to share with you that our teams should be in a position to come up with the interim agreement, the early harvest part of the final comprehensive economic partnership in the next 30 days. Both sides have been very, very fair and understanding about the sensitivities that each side has about certain issues. Australia has certain sensitivities, India has certain sensitivities, and the good part of this friendship is that we have respected each other's sensitivities and the agreement is uh, an agreement which is only a win-win. I think the, the Quad has just add, added to the strength of, of the relationship and uh, I, I think what we'll see is it will continue to develop and grow and enhance the relationship not only between Australia and India but of all countries of, of the Quad. And, you know, down the track we, we have free trade agreements with the United States, we have one with, with Japan, 
Uh, my hope is in, in 30 days we will have an announcement with, with India and then we can start to, to build the economic cooperation and, and framework also within the, uh, within the, the countries of, of the Quad. So it's a, a special and, and unique relationship. And Foreign ministers of Australia and India, part of the Quad Group, met in the Australian city of Melbourne on February 12, 2022. During the meeting, the Indian Foreign Minister criticized China's economic actions towards Australia and blamed China for the ongoing border conflict in eastern Ladakh between India and China. Surely, Beijing has mixed emotions about its growing isolation internationally as Australia moves closer to countries like Lithuania and India and gains more allies. With regard to the rights and wrongs of China-Australia's relations, we have already elaborated on China's position many times, and I will not repeat it here. The ins and outs of the China-India border situation are very clear, and the responsibility does not lie with China. At present, China and India are in communication on further improving border management and control, as well as confidence-building measures. We hope that India will strictly abide by a series of agreements signed by the two sides, refrain from making irresponsible remarks, and take concrete actions to work with China and jointly safeguard peace and tranquility in the border area. The statements of Chinese diplomats illustrate the trait of the CCP, which is to never admit mistakes and end up being caught in one misjudgment after another for a very long time. It has been noted that the CCP has been particularly tough on Australia compared to other Western countries. For example, on the issues of the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, many countries around the world don't support the bullying behavior of the CCP. The US, UK, and Canadian warships have crossed the Taiwan Strait several times, but Beijing has only shouted a few words of opposition and done nothing more. However, when Australia took a stand in support of the US and its allies, the Chinese official media vowed to launch a missile attack on its homeland. In May 2021, Prime Minister Morrison said that the Australian government's policy toward Taiwan would remain unchanged and that Australia would honor its commitment to support the US and its allies if the CCP invaded Taiwan by force. In response, Hu Shi Jin, editor-in-chief of Global Times, the CCP's official media, said he advocated that the communist authorities should develop a plan for retaliatory punishment against Australia in the event of Australian military interference in the Taiwan Strait, including long-range strikes against Australian military facilities and key assets. Why does he propose this? Firstly, there are economic considerations. Australia is heavily dependent on exports of minerals, energy, and agricultural products, with more than a third of every dollar of Australian goods exported going to China. From a trade perspective, this makes Australia the most dependent developed economy in the world on the Chinese market. Another factor that deserves attention is how heavily the CCP has infiltrated Australia. This infiltration is not only at the political, economic, diplomatic, and cultural levels, but it has even penetrated into everyday life in the community. The latest census for 2016 shows that Australia has a population of 24.4 million. For the first time, the number of immigrants from Asia surpassed that of European and American immigrants, with ethnic Chinese topping the list of newcomers and the population exceeding 1.21 million. Mandarin has become the second most spoken language in Australia. In the discussion among Chinese people, there is a saying, the four major immigrant countries for Chinese, the US is too difficult to immigrate, Canada is too cold, and New Zealand is too small. It is normal for one remaining country, Australia, to be popular. The influx of Chinese into Australia has also opened up opportunities for the CCP. A Chinese elder living in Canberra told overseas Chinese media that on a Sunday morning in June 2016, officials from Beijing told Chinese elders at the Canberra Multicultural Centre through the Australia-China Association, Australia is in the corner of the world, no one comes. Only we Chinese come. If we don't have a voice, who has a voice? On the one hand, the Chinese immigrant population has become the target that the CCP tries to rope in. On the other hand, the once extremely wealthy CCP has infiltrated Australia with money and lies on all fronts. To this day, Beijing does not seem to want to come out of its delusion and has not stopped provoking Australia in the political, diplomatic and military territories.
On February 17, 2022, the Australian Defence Department said a P-8A Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft was illuminated while flying over Australia's northern approaches by a laser from a People's Liberation Army naval vessel, potentially endangering lives. The Chinese vessel was sailing east with another PLAN ship through the Arafura Sea at the time of the incident. The sea lies between the north coast of Australia and the south coast of New Guinea. Both ships have since transited through the Torres Strait and were in the Coral Sea. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison accused Beijing of an act of intimidation. It was a dangerous act. Um, these sorts of things um, can uh, disable such aircraft and put those on that aircraft at great risk. So I thought it was a reckless and irresponsible act and, uh, and it, uh, it should not occur. Now we're raising those issues uh, directly through the diplomatic and defence channels but uh, what I can tell you is the way Australia stands up to coercion and bullying and intimidation and threats is what my government has been doing. According to a report by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, in 2019, Australian pilots conducting military exercises over the South China Sea were subjected to a series of laser attacks fired by a CCP maritime militia. It caused the pilots to force a landing on a warship and be subjected to a medical examination. This is not the first time a CCP warship has lasered a foreign aircraft. On February 17, 2020, a CCP Navy destroyer lasered a U.S. Navy Pacific P-8A Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft while it was flying over international waters. Sensors on the U.S. patrol aircraft could detect that the CCP destroyer was using a laser that was invisible to the naked eye. Weapons-grade lasers have the potential to cause serious injury to service members and can damage all types of ship and aircraft systems. In May 2018, Pentagon officials disclosed that CCP military personnel in Djibouti, Africa, used high-powered laser beams aimed at U.S. pilots, resulting in minor injuries to two U.S. pilots. And it's not just important for Australia, but I think all around the region, um, this explanation should be provided as to why a military vessel, a naval vessel, in Australia's exclusive economic zone would undertake such an act, such a dangerous act, um, in relation to Australian surveillance aircraft, legitimately doing what it's doing, doing their job, being where they have every right to be, and uh, that act of intimidation is not just a message um, that I suppose they're trying to send to Australia, a message that we will respond to, but it is a sign of the sort of threats and intimidation that can occur to any country in our region. And that's why we need to band together. In 2018, Australia introduced two important anti-foreign infiltration bills, the National Security Legislation Amendment, or Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, and the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act. In December 2020, the Morrison government announced the new Foreign Relations Act, which cancels agreements between Australian states, territories and local authorities, and foreign governments that are incompatible with Australia's national interests. On November 17, 2021, the Australian government announced the guidelines to counter foreign interference in the Australian university sector. This series of laws is a timely measure taken by the Australian government to stop the CCP's massive penetration. Beijing has maintained a stealthy grip on all aspects of Australia through years of cultivation. In or before May 2022, Australian voters will participate in the 2022 federal election. In his annual threat assessment, Australian Security Intelligence Service Director Mike Burgess revealed that the agency defeated an attempted plot to interfere in the Australian election in which a foreign government tried to plant an agent within a political party through a wealthy individual acting as the mastermind using a series of complex operations. Burgess said the wealthy businessman hired another person to carry out the foreign interference and used an overseas bank account to fund the operation for hundreds of thousands of Australian dollars. Labour Senator Kimberly Kitching said on February 14th, under the protection of parliamentary privilege, that she had reliable information that the man behind the operation was wealthy businessman Chow Chuck Wing, and asked Burgess for confirmation of it. Chow Chuck Wing later issued a statement saying that Kitching's allegations were baseless. Originally from mainland China, Chow Chuck Wing has become an Australian citizen and is involved in real estate development. He has donated more than 4 million Australian dollars to major political parties since 2004. He has also donated more than 45 million Australian dollars to Australian universities. 
According to the information posted on the Chow Chuck Wing Foundation website, Australian Labour Party leader Anthony Albanese attended the opening banquet of the Chow Chuck Wing Museum on November 16, 2020, and delivered a speech. Australian media news.com.au revealed that according to information provided by sources within the government, Prime Minister Morrison declined to attend the party for national security reasons, and that former Liberal Party leader Brendan Nelson and former New South Wales Premier Bob Carr also attended the party at the time. The Global Times, the CCP's official media, published an article on February 14, 2022, with the headline, Weak Australian leadership inhibits potential relationship reset with China. It also tweeted on the same day, Albanese will not be a charismatic leader, but he positively shines compared to Morrison. Such is the abysmal state of Oz politics. One would like to see a reset in ties with China, but Oz leadership is weak and US pressure is sustained. To this day, there are still panda huggers in the Australian political arena. In a speech at the National Press Club in Canberra on November 10, 2021, former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating repeated twice that Taiwan is not an important interest for Australia. He said, We have no alliance with Taipei, no. There is not a single document of alliance with Taipei in Canberra. We don't recognize it as a sovereign state. The Taiwan issue is fundamentally a civil issue for China. On the Chinese Communist Party, Keating said, we have to deal with them because they are going to be very powerful in this part of the world. But it's clear that such a political view is no longer the mainstream in Australia. The Chinese Communist Party is still trying, but times have changed dramatically. While some Australian officials and business people will still dream of expanding the Chinese market, there is clearly not a reset moment ahead as Beijing expects.